Well, we're very excited to have Greg Lewis present this uh, really cool work on the welfare impact of consumer reviews. Uh, why don't you take it away, Greg? Thank you. Um, so uh, this is joint work with Yoga Service. So I bet a bunch of you guys know um, who's at BU is Andre's colleague. Um, and this is work we've been working on for a very long time. I'm excited uh, to present it, but also uh, it reminds me that we really should write up a paper and send it somewhere. So uh, this, is, this is good motivation. Thank you very much for uh, giving us that mental prompt. Um, uh, and, and so what I'm presenting is gonna be a mix of older stuff and newer stuff that we've done on this paper and um, all the results that we have kind of seem to line up across many different versions, but they're from different specifications at different points because we haven't collected them to a paper. So nothing should be taken as literally like this is our final answer on a topic, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so let me, uh, let me tell you what the goal of the paper is. The goal of the paper is uh, to measure how crowdsourced ratings have affected consumer demand, firm pricing, but most importantly, the distribution of welfare in the hotel industry. Um, and the reason we are interested in that question is because uh, we think that uh, consumer reviews have played an important role in many markets, and I'll sort of illustrate this later. And we have an idea that they affect demand because there have been many papers on this topic. And again, I'll refer to those papers later, but Mike Luca's work, for example, on Yelp, I'm sure many of us know. Um, but we don't know whether this is actually doing very much uh, to, to improve consumer welfare. So just to fix ideas, what are we talking about precisely? We're talking about um, the star ratings that you'll see, for example, uh, on Expedia or on TripAdvisor. So this, this 4.3 out of 5 uh, next to the Shelburne, right? We now know that the Shelburne seems to be a little bit worse than the Courtyard, which is 4.4 out of 5. Does knowing that information really allow consumers to make better decisions and in so doing uh, improve consumer welfare? Okay, so the motivation here is, um, is that reviews are widely used in e-commerce. I started to think of all the places where I, I think of reviews being used, uh, Amazon, Yelp, TripAdvisor, Etsy, Expedia, eBay. And it turns out, I, I checked this out yesterday, uh, last night, these are some of the most visited sites on the internet. So this is where people are spending a lot of the time that they spend consuming content. Obviously, they spend a lot more time on Netflix. But, uh, but certainly when they're thinking about shopping, this is something they're doing. Um, and so, you know, people are read, sitting there reading reviews to some extent, and we really want to know, is this particularly helpful? Um, there's a lot of related literature, which I'm just going to briefly mention. But for a long time, people spent a, a, a lot of time thinking about how the internet was going to be important for price information. So thinking about whether this would increase price competition, there was a lot of interest in the study of the so-called law of one price, uh, that the internet would drive prices down to marginal costs. And if the answer to that was just generally no in many ways. And then people started to move on to the question of uh, what about non-price information? So uh, I think of one of the classic papers there being Jen and Leslie in 2003 on hygiene uh, grade cards being given to restaurants and seeing does that change demand? That's not an internet example, but it was certainly a, sort of a, an important paper there. And then papers on book reviews, uh, Mike Luca's work and other people's work on Yelp. And, and then more recently, um, uh, Rymers and Waldfogel thinking about Amazon book reviews, trying to think about the effect of professional reviews of, of books versus amateur crowdsourced reviews of books and trying to disentangle the, the differential impact of those two channels. What's going to be distinct about this paper is that we're going to really think hard about welfare. So many of the ratings papers, the Yelp papers are thinking about revenue. So basically, if you get more stars, do you make more money? But here we're going to be very much interested in what this does to, uh, to consumers. And in particular, we're also interested in a market in which there are going to be meaningful supply side pricing effects. So the hotel market is not a big market. Um, well, it's not, you know, it's, it, there are many hotels in the city, but there are not, you know, a hundred or a thousand of them. And so it's going to be the case that people are going to actually adjust their prices in response to uh, ratings. And this potentially is a channel through which um, welfare effects could become muted. And I'll show you that when we get to the theory. Okay. So what's the, uh, the thesis of the paper? Uh, this is the basic story we're going to try to tell. So hotel quality is going to evolve over time. And we're going to have a long panel to measure this. So it's going to be important to think about that. But it's partially unknown to consumers. So consumers have some information about quality, but they don't really know it for sure. Hotel ratings are going to be a signal of quality. And therefore, they're going to affect demand. When people consume this content, read these ratings and reviews, 
they're going to be able to um, update. And so this is taking a pretty strong stance actually on the role of ratings, that ratings are a purely an informative channel here, right? Nobody's persuaded, nobody gets high utility as a result of reading a hotel review or rating. They're just persuade, uh, they're just informed about which are better and worse ratings, uh, hotels. Uh, third, uh, equilibrium prices are a function of demand um, and therefore they're a function of ratings. And so it's gonna be important to think about supply side responses to this, the, the change in demand induced by ratings. And therefore, because there is gonna be a supply side response, effects on the distribution of wealth are ambiguous. It's not just the case that consumers are all uniformly better off because of this extra information, because it's a game. And as we know in game theory, providing information can lead to everybody being worse off. Um, and so therefore it must be measured using a structural model. There are many things that are not in this paper and so it's worth spending maybe a bit of time highlighting them. Um, the first is that consumers are making a single purchase decision and firms are optimizing prices for static profits. Um, and so we're doing everything as though it's static. And in fact, we know that consumers visit hotels repeatedly and as they revisit them repeatedly, they may become more informed and no longer rely on ratings. We're not gonna model that. Um, and firms, of course, may be thinking a little bit about the dynamic problem of, if I know that I might have repeat customers, how do I think about charging prices? We won't be doing that either. Maybe, maybe more important, I think, is, is sort of the sense in which we're oversimplifying the whole review process. We're already thinking about these ratings four out of five stars, but in fact, consumers are gonna read text, they're gonna read photos. They may be able to uh, improve their welfare by matching on horizontal characteristics. TripAdvisor will tell you what a romantic hotel looks like, uh, you know, which is the best romantic hotels. Maybe that's what you need right now. And that's a meaningful uh, source of value, not the four to half out of five. Um, we're not gonna be looking at that either, uh, primarily to simplify our lives, but you know, it, it suggests that we're probably gonna understate the welfare benefits. I mean, the third thing is missing dynamics. So we're not looking at firm side entry, investment, and exit decisions. Um, and one of, the, one of the channels by which you think reviews might matter and people have written papers about this is by giving customer voice, basically. So by giving them a, an opportunity to say, I'm unhappy with something and then having firms respond to it. And this may have meaningful effects on the market. We're not gonna really look at that. Um, entry and exit in the hotel market, it turns out is not, that important perhaps because there's not a lot of it. It's, a, it's these giant capital investments. And so they're not gonna be very responsive to reviews, um, but investment might be, and, uh, and we're, not gonna, we're not gonna see that at all. Okay, so the modified uh, okay. goal, yeah. Okay. Uh, there, there's one question from Jack. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you wanna ask it. Uh, yeah, can you, can you really study the effect of ratings without taking into account the way they enter into the recommendation algorithm of the platforms? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I think you can, um, because what we're gonna do is look at the effect on the all up market of the major review sources. So, um, so, okay, a couple of responses. So one is that, you know, much of demand is mediated through these platforms. So you go into TripAdvisor, you get the rating, you go through the recommendation algorithm, right? Um, but it is also the true that many people will consult TripAdvisor for, for information and then go book somewhere else completely. And at least from this point of view of the data we're looking at, one of the advantages we have is that the data we're looking at is uh, from SDR, Smith Travel Research. And so we're looking at basically a very, very large chunk of the hotel market through all booking sources, not just through the platforms themselves. And so it is true that at least some of the consumers are, are, are being mediated through the way that the algorithm reacts to those ratings, um, but some of them are not. So that's one response. And I think the other thing to say is just that, you know, to the extent that these are sort of coexisting, um, we're just not going to be able to separate them. So if, it, you know, if a large fraction of, of demand is being mediated through the way that TripAdvisor ranks people, um, we're just going to be looking at the all-up effect of how a ratings point translates through the TripAdvisor algorithm all the way through to demand. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I think you're, I mean, you're right. It's, you're also stating an important concern, which is um, the algorithms themselves, the ranking algorithms are in many ways much more important than the, the ratings um, in terms of how consumer attention is directed in general. 
Okay, so what do we find? Um, we find that hotel reviews have substantial effects on demand um, and consequently on prices. Uh, we, when we get to prices, you will see that you know, the price effects are not that big and that's because the hotel market is not that concentrated. So there are, there are some price effects that are not as substantial as maybe we thought ex ante they would be. Um, okay, we find, we find um, the demand effects are big. We find a rating point increases demand by about 27.8% in the final year of our data, which is 2014. I'll show you that there's an upward trend throughout the data, um, throughout the sample. So one of the nice things about having a panel is we can do this year by year, and we can show that the effect of having higher online ratings becomes more and more pronounced year on year. Um, there's substantial heterogeneity. So the effects are bigger for high-end hotels, the effects are bigger for independent hotels. Um, and that sort of makes a lot of sense. You'd expect that where people care a lot about quality, as in when they're looking at five-star hotels, they really care about going to the very best such five-star hotel. And so the effects are substantial. Um, we find that without allowing prices to adjust, consumers are about $2 a room night off, worse off without ratings, um, which is about 2% roughly in our data. Um, and when we allow prices to adjust, consumers are about 1% or $1 a room night worse off without ratings. Although this is, uh, this is, you know, this is distributed over the population. So in our model, we allow for consumers to have differential preferences for, for quality. And the people who are, who really want high quality are going to be much worse off. They're going to be 6% worse off in the absence of ratings because they're not going to be able to find these best hotels anymore. Um, and yeah, so, you know, these, these, I don't know how to think about these numbers. These numbers seem small, but realistic to me. So sort of 2%. I remember having this slightly dispiriting um, uh, experience of giving this talk at, at Princeton once and enlisting pr people's priors before the talk as to what they thought the number would be. And they were like, yeah, about 2%. And I was like, oh, that's disappointing. Um, you know, it's like, it's like, okay, this is not surprising. This is sort of exactly what people think. Um, but, but, you know, hopefully that means it's somewhat realistic. Um, so why didn't we, why haven't we written this paper up and sent it somewhere? Well, we spent a lot of time doing two things that we probably didn't need to do, at least the first one. The second one seems important. So the first thing is we decided to, to estimate BLP using maximum likelihood um, and without additional instruments. Um, and we'll probably switch to GMM pretty soon, but, uh, but we did that and that took us on a long, long side journey through many, many Jacobians and Hessians. Um, the second, the second thing is we decided to um, think about capacity constraints seriously on the supply side. So obviously if you're, if you're selling a good and you've got capacity constraints, your first order conditions are going to look different because, you know, sometimes your capacity constraints will be binding and you want to anticipate that when you decide how much to price at. Um, and so Chris Conlon and Julie Mortimer have worked on this before, um, but the models that they have are not very computationally tractable. And so we've tried to work on some different ways of looking at that that are a little bit more straightforward. Um, and so that's, that's something I'll show you a little bit at the end. Okay, so I've got about 30 minutes, 25 minutes maybe, oh gosh, I'm gonna say 25-ish, um, to go through the data and descriptives. I'll tell you a little bit about the causal effect of reviews, theory and structural model counterfactuals. I'm gonna skip more than I've said on these slides. I can see I'm gonna run out of time. Okay, so, uh, the data is from Smith Travel Research. We have a complete census of about 6,000 hotels in the Western United States. It's about 10% of the US hotel market and about 45% of the hotels report financial performance to STR. So we, we know all the hotels in the market. In addition, we have this financial performance data, which includes revenue, prices, occupancy rates for every hotel year month. So we're gonna be looking at you know, the Sheraton Palo Alto in January 2014, which is 1.2 billion room nights. Um, and so we have a lot of, we have a lot of data here. Um, we don't have that many observations, but we have hundreds of thousands of observations. Um, and we observe a set of attributes for every hotel. And then we augment this data set with a panel of consumer reviews from TripAdvisor, Expedia, and Hotels.com, which were the main three websites during that period for finding, um, for finding uh, reviews. For some subset of the hotels and years, we have daily data on revenue and prices, so at a higher frequency. And that's going to be important when we talk about the possibility that a hotel might sell out and trying to measure uh, demand in the presence of capacity constraints. 
And then finally, last data issue, for the structural model, we're gonna use imputation procedures sometimes to complete our data set. So we're gonna match non-reporting hotels with reporting ones to get data on the full set of hotels in the market. Um, that's important because if we only observe half the market, obviously competing with 10 other firms looks very different than competing with 20 other firms. We don't wanna use our incomplete data and make completely wrong assumptions about market power. So we, we use the full census and then do some work to try and fill things out. Um, okay, so the first time I'm gonna show you is something that I, I might generally spend a lot of time on, but I'm not gonna spend very much time on it today. I'm gonna to try to show you that there's a causal effect of reviews, that reviews are going to matter. And then I wanna move very quickly onto the structural model. Um, uh, Greg, guess, can I, can I yeah. uh, just interrupt you for, there was a clarifying question from the audience. I'll, I'll just say it, which is, uh, yeah. one, um, are you concerned that the, these platforms might not uh, display all the ratings? They might like remove some of the reviews from their platform for whatever reason. And then two, which is I think a different point, um, it's been shown that there's like review inflation in certain markets where reviews are going up over time, kind of in a secular trend. And how do you think about that? So just, just Yeah, so we're, we're in some ways we have this very kind of agnostic and somewhat, I don't know, I want to say lazy, I don't think lazy is the right word, but approach this, which is to say, yes, there's probably review fraud, there's probably some review inflation, there's probably some review manipulation, and all of these are going on, and yet consumers will show you are trusting these things more and more. So the market is generally paying a lot of attention to reviews. So I guess one thing you could be concerned about, and we'll come to this right at the end, is that we're going to assume that consumers are an average right. So when they see a 4.4 instead of a 4.1, they have some taste for the, the 0.3 in additional you know, in, in ratings that they can convert to utils. And on average, they're getting that right. They're not being systematically deceived when they, when they think that they're gonna get more utility from a 4.4 than a 4.1. Um, but we need that to hold on average. So individual review forward, so the small manipulations with edges are not gonna matter. And another way of interpreting the welfare stuff is the coefficients that they place in front of ratings, that the sort of the, their preferences for ratings are basically built on how much trust they have in the marketplace. What we're gonna show you is that there seems to be a fair amount of trust in this data, even though it may not be perfect, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so uh, so what are we going to do? I'm going to show you that reviews matter, and I think the the easiest way for us me to show that to you is just to show you a bunch of OLS regressions. Um, if I have a little bit of time, I might talk about the instrumental variables approach. I won't talk at all about the natural experiment. We also have data from a natural experiment that sort of is designed to prove causality. Um, so the demand here is going to be basically a glorified logit, uh, at least until I get to the structural model. So people are going to have, uh, uh, there's going to be demand, which is essentially a, a, a market share ratio. So it's the log ratio of my share as hotel J in time T to the outside good uh, in time T, where our, our measure of the outside good is, um, is essentially uh, the maximum uh, size of the market in any given month across our entire data set. Um, we, we stick in, uh, so that, that, that dependent variable is a function of ratings. It's a function of whether uh, there's missing ratings, which we then dummy out. We add in hotel fixed effects, and we add in mo market time period fixed effects. So San Francisco in February is a fixed effect. Um, and so really what's going on is if we're trying to identify why ratings matter here, we're asking what is, you know, the identifying variation is the within markets ratings fluctuations. Taking out a hotel fixed effect, so the same hotel, we're really looking at how their ratings vary over time and how demand then co-varies with it. And then we're also taking out a bunch of seasonality at a very fine grained level because we're looking, taking out fixed effects at the hotel month, um, at the market month level. Um, you could still, of course, be worried that the specification, you know, it has fixed effects, but there could be endogeneity. It could be the case that uh, ratings are correlated with marketing efforts, that contemporaneous marketing is really driving people to the hotel, and then the ratings follows that. So you, you, I, I market aggressively that this is a great hotel. People go there and later they then tell you, yes, this was a great hotel. Um, and then we have an endogeneity problem. For the moment, let's just ignore that, and I'll come back to it in a second. Um, 
so what we what we do is we we run this regression and we run it in a bunch of different ways so we run a, a straight regression which just looks over the entire data set and asks what is the value of a rating point for essentially a percentage change in demand it's about six percent we then cut by um by management type and we find that chain management hotels don't get uh, quite as much of an effect from ratings as franchises do, which in turn get less of an effect than independent hotels. This makes sense to us because independent hotels don't have the sort of the brand effect behind them. They need more information. We also do this by, uh, by how uh, fancy the hotel is and, and STR ranks them from economy through luxury and the coefficients line up in that order. So basically as you get, uh, as a hotel gets more upscale, it becomes more and more important that it has high ratings for demand. And that again makes sense to us. And then finally, we have this sort of pattern of, of, uh, of uh, coefficients going from 2005 through 2014. And those are again increasing over time um, to eventually quite a high level, sort of 25%. A full rating point, of course, is a, is a giant deviation, right? A more real, realistic deviation is about 0.1 or 0.2 rating points. Um, but if you could raise your rating by an entire, your, your hotel uh, rating by a full rating point, that would be a 25% jump in demand. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's very substantial. There are, there are some sort of non monotonicities here. We seem to have something to do with the financial crisis. There was a bit of a dip. But in general, the pattern is that people are paying more and more attention to these ratings over time. Okay, um, so let me talk briefly. Uh, yeah, sure, very briefly about other ways you could get at this. Um, so we have this idea of using an IV. Um, we have reviews from three different distinct platforms, TripAdvisor, Hotels, and Expedia, and their importance changes over time. In fact, the main thing that happens is the TripAdvisor becomes much more important in the last half of our sample. It really it gets way more traffic. Um, when I looked at the most important websites, TripAdvisor is the top 20 website, Expedia and Hotels.com are not anymore. And so the TripAdvisor has really got a lot more traffic. Um, and so what we can do is we can go ahead and measure engagement uh, through Google Trends as looking at the market platform combination. So TripAdvisor in San Francisco, we go and look at engagement as measured by Google Trends with that phrase over time. And then what we do is we use these two new measures of ratings. So the first is an engagement weighted uh, platform average. So we're going to go look across these three platforms. We're going to use as weights the engagement from these various platforms. Um, from, so as engagement as measured by Google for these various platforms. And so now uh, your rating in any given time period is going to be a function of how much people are currently engaging with that platform. So it's important to be doing very well on TripAdvisor at the end of the sample where that's the dominant platform. We're then going to form an instrument, which is going to be the same, uh, it's going to be a weighted rating, but now the, the weights are the deviations from the averages over this time period. So now it's going to be the case that uh, the instrument says, uh, if you're doing better on TripAdvisor at a time where TripAdvisor is dominant, the instrument is going to be positive. If you're doing well on TripAdvisor at a time when TripAdvisor is not that important, the instrument's going to be negative. And the idea here is going to be that, um, the emitted demand shocks, whatever they may be, are going to be assumed to be independent of the aggregate change in platform tastes. And so as long as I'm willing to believe that whatever this one hotel is doing in terms of its marketing efforts is unrelated to the global changes and preferences of these different platforms, um, the instrument is going to be valid and excluded. Um, and so we can run, we can then carry through the same scheme, but do it as an IV. And what we find is that um, the IV is considerably less stable. So you'll see the the standard errors are just much, much, much bigger. Um, the first stage is not nearly as good as we'd like, but you get the same general trend in platform engagement over time. Uh, the coefficients are slightly attenuated uh, sort of throughout. Um, so we're getting slightly smaller effects from the ID than we get from the OLS, um, but still, still big and still on the order of sort of 25% ish by, uh, by 2014. Oh yeah, so I moved through that very quickly. Hopefully that was uh, enough to give you the, sort of the vague sense of what the IV strategy is. Let me talk quickly about the theory uh, and then the structural model. So I'm trying to decide how much the theory to do. Okay, so let's think quickly about this in terms of a, uh, a hoteling model. 
So imagine that you're in a world like 2005 where maybe people were not that well informed about hotels. So here I've got two hotels, A and B. Uh, hotels can be high or low quality, um, but people don't know which is which. And they have priors that it's equally likely that A is better than B, then B is better than A. And the assumption is that one of them is good and one of them is bad. So in that world, it's a completely symmetric hoteling model. Uh, the hotels are gonna split the market. They're gonna charge the same prices. The prices are gonna be equal to the transportation cost. And that's sort of a baseline. So, okay, so this is one way of thinking about the world without information. Now let's ask the question, what happens when a platform comes to town and tells you which is the better hotel? So once we know that hotel is say the better hotel than B, suddenly, you know, hotel is going to grab, A is going to grab a large share of the market. Um, and if prices didn't adjust, the threshold type would be given this by this expression here and A would get a lot of the market. All the consumers would weakly benefit, but in fact, only the ones who switch hotels are going to strictly benefit. So the people who would have bought from A beforehand don't benefit, the information did nothing for them. Likewise, the people who are very close to B and don't switch the decision, but the people between 0.5 and this, this theta bar do benefit. They switch and they, they now buy from the better hotel. What's going to happen next? There's going to be price adjustment. And with price adjustment, hotel A is going to raise their price because it's commonly known that they are better. Hotel B is going to lower their price because it's commonly known that they are worse. The threshold type is going to move back towards uh, hotel A. And hotel A is going to charge more and hotel B less. Um, and so now what happens to consumers? Well, there's a mix, actually. And it's interesting, the distribution of wealth there. Um, the people who are near B, who are very near B, are actually better off uh, after the information is released that the hotel is bad because hotel B drops their price. They were going to buy from them anyway because they were convenient. And, then now, they now, uh, and they now get a lower price. People who are even better off are the people who are near the bid point who switched to the better hotel. They've chosen to switch despite the high prices. We know that they're doing better um, and they're benefiting from the improved quality. But there are people who are losing in this world and they're the people who uh, are near Hotel A who now have to pay more for the same hotel that they would have, than, the, than they would have chosen without the reviews. And you can think of this as like what happens when it's your neighborhood restaurant and it's beautiful and nobody ever goes there and it has fantastically good quality and then tell, somebody writes up a review in the Times and suddenly everybody goes there, right? This is not, this is not ideal. Um, and so of course, there's gonna be a distribution of, of wealth and benefits. And so that's sort of what we're interested in here. Um, okay, and so how are we gonna get at this when we try to do this uh, using data as opposed to in theory? The first step is to estimate demand. And that's really gonna be important. We wanna know how it is, you know, we have a hoteling model here, but we know the preferences are gonna be more complicated. What's the relationship between tastes and prices and ratings. That's the main thing to figure out. Once we know that, we're gonna try and simulate demand when ratings are not known. Um, but in order to get the prices correct, we're gonna to have to write down supply side first order conditions and then suppress the information and allow prices to re-equilibrate and see what the market would look like in the absence of this information. So what would it be like if you know, in 2014, we somehow took away the ratings again and people weren't informed like they were in 2005. And then measure the change in consumer surplus across these scenarios. Okay, so this is easy to write down. As I'm sure everybody knows, it's hard to do. Um, what are we going to do here? We're gonna have people forming beliefs um, about quality that they don't know. Their beliefs are gonna be based on rating. Uh, their beliefs are gonna be based on things that are, that are fixed about hotels, like that it has a gym, or that it's a, 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 a Four Seasons, which we know has a good brand. Um, and then characteristics unobserved to us, which have some notation psi. And so essentially what we end up writing down is a, a model in which there's a true utility, there are beliefs about that utility, and therefore there's expected utility. And expected utility is gonna have a random coefficient on ratings. So there's fixed effects of various forms. There's a logic taste shock. There's some uh, disutility of price, but most importantly, there's a random coefficient on ratings. And so this is going to look like uh, a VLP model of demand. Uh, Greg, can I ask a quick question from the, from the yeah. audience? Yeah, so um, the same hotel has many types of rooms and they cost a different amount of money. And so 
how do you think about that aggregation? We, yeah, we, again, we collapse that, right? So we have um, revenue and we have occupancy uh, and we just go ahead and we said, that's the average price. And so essentially what we're thinking about here is average rooms that are being sold. And yeah, I mean, hopefully that doesn't bias things too much. Um, it, it doesn't seem sort of first order here. Yeah. Um, and then, and then I have, a, I guess, a, an additional question. And maybe, maybe I missed this. So it seems like you have a random coefficient on ratings, uh, but not on price. Um, but your theory model had, price, well, I guess no. I guess maybe your theory model didn't have different price sensitivity. But, but one would think that there are distributional implications here of the yeah, price changing. I sort of agree with that. Um, yeah. So I, I agree, uh, and I sort of think that it. We didn't do it because we wanted to make our lives simpler, but I could imagine somebody reasonably asking us to do that and we would do it, but maybe not now. Uh, oh yeah, so, um, so we, 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 we assume away the endogeneity of ratings, um, uh, but we can, we can fix this when we do GMM because we have IVs, so we'll fix that at some point. Um, the main thing that we're worried about is price endogeneity here. And in the hotel market, price endogeneity turns out to be really quite difficult to deal with. Uh, the BLP instruments turn out to be pretty weak. The Hausman instruments are not very good either um, because it's a geographic market. And so what we do instead is we add a supply side, which we need anyway for our, for our structural counterfactuals, and we add a particular independence assumption. And let me quickly show you what that is. So we're going to, in BLP, typically you have two equations that are important. You have an equation for mean utility which is this, this delta JM on the left-hand side. And that has an error. This is the unobserved demand shocks. And you have a cost equation. And that has an unobserved cost shock. And it turns out it's, it's sufficient for identification to assume that those two objects are independent of each other. So if we're willing to assume that uh, the cost shock and the demand shock are independent, you're in okay shape. Um, and, and here we have a lot of fixed effects, so we don't feel that bad about it. So, you know, I would generally tend to think that the Four Seasons is a good hotel. Uh, it costs more because it provides better amenities. It's high utility. If I didn't have a fixed effect in there, I would think that those two things were very correlated. But having at least conditioned on the fact that it is the Four Seasons, maybe I'm willing to believe that shocks to demand and shocks to costs are not correlated. Um, and so that, that's the approach we've taken here. Um, and I'm not going to argue why that's true because I don't have that much time. But, but in any case, you can do this, and we have done this, um, and it goes badly, at least it did the first time. And the reason it goes badly is because of capacity constraints. So let me talk quickly about capacity constraints because I think this is actually quite important. So if you have um, three hotels in a market, say, you have very simple logit demand, they're equally attractive, and they have capacities one, two, and three, and there's a market size of four, since they're equally attractive, the quote unquote first three part people to the market are going to split the hotels evenly. But then hotel one sells out. And the next person who comes in, person four, is going to have to be split evenly between two and three. Okay. Observed sales are one, 1 1.5, and 1.5. And so if you look at those sales and you ignore capacity constraints, you come to the conclusion that hotels two and three are better than hotel one. But in fact, it's just the hotel one is small, right? It can't take that many people. Um, and so you have to basically correct for this if you're going to do, estimate demand correctly. Um, here's also a good point to point out what, where, what we're going to do is different from what um, uh, uh, Chris and, and Julie do in their paper. So what they do when they think about vending machines and capacity constraints is they're not willing to make this continuum assumption that I can hypothetically have a person subdivide themselves into a continuum and evenly split themselves among the hotels. They're going to actually have literally people walking up to a vending machine and buying a Snickers and then the Snickers sell out. And so that one person, individual person's uh, idiosyncratic shock, they happen to like Snickers is going to matter a lot, but it's going to be computationally kind of a nightmare. Um, and so here we're going to make this a simplifying assumption that people, as they arrive, are kind of like, are behaving like smooth logic continuum consumers one by one. Um, okay, so that doesn't work. Uh, what can you do instead? You could add data. Um, and so we have data that has daily data. And what we can prove is that you can do an inversion if you know more information. 
So what, what are we, what are we going to use specifically? We're going to take, um, we're going to take market shares at the monthly level, which we have, but also daily market size measures. So how many people book hotels every day? And there's a lot of variation by day of the week. Okay. So the combination of monthly market shares, but also daily market sizes allows us to tell you how often it's going to be the case that, um, that some hotels are just going to sell out because there's going to be a fluctuation in demand that day. And it turns out that there's a unique inversion from the vector of capacity constraints, market sizes, um, market shares, and daily demands back to the mean utilities. And we go ahead and we do that. And then, you know, this is a more complicated procedure than the usual BLP inversion. And Jorgis did a ton of clever programming to make it work, but you can recover mean utilities. Um, and I can sort of prove that you can do that, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, and then what I can do is write down an appropriate capacity, uh, supply side as well. And the supply side first order condition is going to have to reflect the fact that sometimes uh, raising your price is costless because for some days of the week, say, say Saturdays, if you're a small hotel, you're likely to sell out. So it makes sense that you want to charge a high price. One thing to say about the supply side is we're assuming here that, um, that hotels set one price for the whole month in the same way that we think about BLP and car pricing. Of course, hotels are smarter than this. They do revenue management. And so this is an oversimplification, um, but it's one that allows us to sort of fit into the standard sort of empirical IO playbook. Um, okay, and then, and then I could show you that if you ignored this, it would make very, very big differences. In particular for hotels that sell out a lot, the extent to which we would get their first order condition wrong can become quite, quite substantial. Uh, if you ignore capacity constraints. Uh, Greg, uh, just a question from the audience, which is how often do uh, these sellouts happen? And, a, and then a follow-up question from me, which is like, in the data, it's not always, it's a kind of a judgment call when the sellout occurs. So what, how did you choose that judgment call? Yeah, both good questions. So uh, hotel sellouts are not, so first of all, why do you have to answer your question? So we'll often say the, the sellouts at 90% is a, is a sellout rate. Um, it could be 95, right? Um, and then there's a question of like, okay, and so how often does it happen? And we're finding, I, I actually can't remember the number off my top of my head, but I think it's sort of like on the order of, um, the order of like 5%, maybe it doesn't happen super often in our data. Um, but uh, importantly, we never actually measure sellouts. What we do instead is do this all through the structure. So um, because we're just using the daily data, total hotel bookings, not individual sellout rates, we never have to make this judgment call. We just have to know how big the market fluctuations are to rationalize our monthly market shares. Um, but we've also done some separate work and try to figure out sellouts and then it's, you know, it's different. Um, okay, we estimate the model by simulated maximum likelihood. We wrote, run model calls in a different paper that showed that this is statistically efficient. It is, it's great, it's just really a pain. Um, and then, uh, and then we, you know, and then we, we plot the distributions of random coefficients. And so, what I'm showing you here is that over time, um, it's more and more the case that, uh, that we're seeing increasing tastes for ratings, people care more about them, and also a, sort of a dispersion is increasing. So how much people care about them is, is changing over time, or that might be a little bit of functional form. Okay, finally, um, let me talk for the next like two minutes about counterfactuals. So what are we gonna do? We estimate all of this, we estimate demand, it takes a long time, we get a price elasticity estimate of about, um, minus two, um, and then we compute counterfactual Nash prices. Here, as I mentioned before, we have to deal with sample selection, uh, so we do some imputation. Um, and then what do we do in the actual counterfactual? We say, suppose that instead of knowing the true rating, um, instead people had, uh, they thought that all the hotels in a given market had the average rating of hotels in that market. So collapsing the 4.8 and 4.2 of the two hotels in the market set of 4.5 and then saying, what would people do when they just thought it was 4.5? Um, and we're going to do a couple of scenarios. We're going to do one where hotels keep the prices the same um, and another where they set them in complete information in equilibrium. As I said before, the change in consumer surplus is about $2 per room night if they stay the same. If they set them in, in random, uh, in complete information in equilibrium, it's going to be the case that uh, the really low-rated hotels are going to charge more. The really high-rated hotels are going to charge less. 
the the effects we're finding are, are in fact almost too small. And so that may, maybe since the structural model doesn't fit, fit perfectly. They're, they're not big though. They're on the order of $6 up at the top and $6 down at the bottom, which maybe says something about, you know, how much market power individual firms have. Nonetheless, you know, this, this scenario has very big effects on, on revenue, right? So uh, hotels at the bottom would make, we estimated 50% more revenue if, if the, the fact that they were bad hotels was suppressed. Um, hotels at the top, and there are way more hotels at the top, would be losing sort of 11% in revenue. So it would be a substantial hit to their revenue. So, this, you know, these ratings are important, um, but, the, but how much they change where people stay and therefore the distribution of consumer surplus is much, much smaller than the individual impacts on firms. Um, and so just to conclude there, um, we find that, you know, uh, in a counterfactual world without ratings, the average, above average hotels, four star plus, are gonna lose market share. They're gonna decrease prices well above average, below average hotels are going to gain market share and increase prices and the effect of consumer surplus is about one to two percent. <laughs> it's much bigger for, um, for firms. It doesn't appear to be to do massive amounts to markups. That is to say the ratings themselves are not quite, um, the ratings changes are not quite big enough to dramatically change markups um, for the firms. Um, and then finally, heterogeneity is important. So Consumer surplus effects are big for the kinds of people who care very much about quality. Um, so those go from sort of one or two percent up to five, six percent, which makes sense. Okay, so that's that's it. I, I wrapped up the last bit in about three minutes, right? <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, thanks for that paper, and I, and I think now uh, Kiara uh, is discussing. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Thumbs up, down. Yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. I really like this paper um, uh, for a few reasons. Uh, the first one is that this is really the first paper that takes seriously the estimation of welfare effects from online reviews. And yes, uh, there's been some follow-up papers. Uh, in K, I I think uh, uh, Reimers is in the call today. Uh, she uh, and Joel Wolfogel have a paper on book reviews. Um, um, but I, I, I would say that these, air, uh, these um, hotel paper precedes it um, by a few years. Um, the, Greg was very upfront about uh, the fact that um, the model is static. They are thinking about maximizing static profits, setting prices statically, and having consumers making one-off decisions. Um, and the fact that the underlying quality is sort of cannot be altered by hotels. Um, the other piece that I really like, um, given our uh, common work, is the fact that they take capacity constraints very seriously. Um, and um, because these has implications on sort of mean utilities that get estimated for hotels that sell out often and hotels that don't sell out but get remaining residual demand because of the sellout of the other hotels. Um, and in terms of results, um, I think they make a lot of sense um, because ratings lead to ma better matching between travelers and hotels. Um, travelers are better off on average. In particular, the benefits accrue to uh, travelers who care about quality. Uh, and just like a very simple back and of the envelope calculation, and I'm not sure it's actually completely correct. Hotels sort of capture about half of these extra surplus, and, and travelers capture the other half of these extra surplus. Um, okay, and, and the other thing is that ratings are more influential for independent hotels, uh, for which consumers won't have strong priors, so also these makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is really about what are we capturing um, and, and, and whether we can separate the role of reviews from the role of the internet and everything else that these online uh, travel agencies are doing. Um, so if I think about online travel agencies, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that demand for hotels would have changed given OTAs even in the absence of consumer ratings. Um, and, and that's just because consumers can find hotels online that they wouldn't have otherwise found, 
okay? There's a, there's a, there's a reduction in, in search costs. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, is there any way to separate really the role of online, uh, online ratings? Um, and this has to do with the type of counterfactuals that you want to run. The current, car the current counterfactual has hotels having the same average rating in the, in the city and month, I believe. Uh, but maybe we should make the average rating be dependent on some observables that consumers have, even in the absence of that five-star review. So for example, you know, there's an expectation for ratings for chain hotels that is different for the expectation of ratings for independent hotels or for different locations within a city. Um, the second thing uh, that I wanted to focus on was the fact that benefits are overwhelmingly concentrated among consumers who really care about quality. And if I've done my simple math correctly, um, if the top quantile, and I think it's quartile, uh, enjoys the most benefits, that means that the other 75% of consumers have negative welfare effects. And so it's super important to really look at the distribution of the losses and gains that these, um, uh, uh, that these ratings have affected. And, and, and here's why I actually um, think, and it's something that Jacques mentioned at the very beginning, um, is it reasonable to think that 75% of consumers get negative benefits from ratings? Probably not. And here's why the ratings are bunched up all the way between 4.9 and five stars. And so I think the ratings as stated don't um, signal the heterogeneity that actually, the heterogeneity of information that consumers can receive from, um, uh, from, uh, from the internet. And so that's why I think in, in a sense, you're estimating the underestimating the benefits of, 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 uh, of ratings because of these, rating bias. Um, okay, and the last thing um, is uh, if you can talk a little bit more about the imputation uh, or how do you think the imputation is gonna affect especially your counterfactuals on independent hotels? Because I, I think I, I, I recall reading that independent hotels are much less likely to share information with Smith Travel Research. And so are you worried that these imputation may sort of um, you know, uh, bias upward the benefits to independent hotels because maybe only independent hotels who are successful are disclosing information to SDR. Um, and with this, I'm done and overall, great paper. Um, shall I respond, Andre? Yeah, okay. Great. So thanks very much, Kira. Those are fantastic comments. Um, I mean, I think so. Your first thing was about what's um, what's really being measured here, and I think. You know, my reaction to that is maybe that you're saying there are these important secular trends that we're kind of not accounting for, like maybe independent hotels becoming important. Perhaps we should consider trying to think about how we could take in, take account of those in the demand system and see what's left over as residual variation that correlates with ratings. So basically, rather than allowing ratings to just be this thing that moves over time, I mean, in some sense, our defense would be, look, within independent hotels, we have variation ratings in part were identified of that, but would it be more convincing if we were able to sort of say, okay, allowing for a trend in the direction of independent hotels, say, um, what's, what's happening there? And so that's, I think that's one thing we could do for sure. Um, your second question was about the distribution of gains. And I think that goes back to the same thing I mentioned at the beginning, which is, you know, there's so much more information in reviews that is being captured by the rating, which I think we're saying the same thing. It's sort of like, it's gonna be an underestimate. It's gonna be an underestimate because we're being too coarse with how do we think about uh, the world. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, think, I think one, it's a great suggestion for us to say, this is what we find, 75% lose, 25% win. This is, this is, and then to say, and, but maybe we're getting it wrong. And I think both those things are important. I think the decomposition of who's winning and losing is very important. And then also to say, okay, but there are these caveats. Um, so I would, I'd 100% agree with that. Um, and then the final thing is you, you, you mentioned the imputation. So, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, we're doing pure selection of observables, right? So to the extent that it's their specific independent hotels that show up in the data to do better, they are gonna get um, overweighted. I'm not sure what I can do about that um, unless I can find some more intelligent imputation procedure or something that uses an IV to check. Um, but it's, yeah, it's worth at least thinking about or trying to do some, some tests on. I don't know what that right solution is there, but that's something for us to think about. <laughs>